evening, prior to his impending crucifixion, Jesus Christ shared something deeply profound with his disciples who would later become the apostles. He shared with them something that has major implications for this moment, something that can be easily overlooked within the span of a week, something that I believe would be a game changer if we would lay hold of its promises. I want to ask you this morning, how familiar are you with John chapter 14, verse 20? John chapter 14, verse 20. There are six words in John chapter 14, verse 20, that according to Gromacki are the essence of Christianity. The very essence of Christianity laid out in six words. And I want to ask us, have we ever spent time reflecting on those words? Meditating on what they mean for our lives. In John chapter 14, verse 20, Jesus shared with his disciples something deeply profound. John chapter 14, verse 20 says, In that day you will know that I am the Father, and you in me, and I in you. Six words. You in me, and I in you. By the words, you and me, Jesus stated that we now have an acceptable position before God. When God sees us, he sees us as those who are in Christ, who have received Christ's righteousness. But how did we receive Christ's righteousness? Well, we, re- we have received his righteousness through faith uh, in Jesus Christ. It's a free gift. That first statement is an identity truth. This is who we are before a holy God. We are in Christ. Wait, Pentecost says it this way. This is what Dwight Pentecost stated. We have been lifted out of our position in the world, out of our relationship to the God of this world, Satan. We have been put into a new relationship in Christ Jesus. And how did those privileges become ours? Because the Spirit of God baptized us into Christ Jesus. Whether you have been physically baptized or not every believer, every believer in Jesus Christ has been spiritually baptized by the Holy Spirit. You may not have been baptized at one of our baptismal services outside, but if you've ever made that decision to trust in Christ as Savior, then at the moment of salvation, the scripture is clear that you have been baptized by the Spirit of God. Physical baptism is a a physical testimony to the church of the work that God has done inside of you. But Jesus didn't stop with those words, you and me. He goes on to say, and I in you, and I in you. And because of the fact that Christ lives in us, we now have power, power that we did not have once before salvation, power to become Christ-like in our words, attitudes, thoughts, and actions. You and me, and I in you, a powerful, powerful statement. I recently had heard of a preacher in the South who preached constantly on water baptism, and the people were getting tired of it. Uh, The deacons suggested he preach on something else. He said, okay, give me the text, and I'll preach on it. So they gave him Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. The next Sunday, he said, by request of the text today, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, he read it and then said, when the Lord created the earth, he made it one-fourth land and three-fourths water, and that brings me to the subject of water baptism. Well, that preacher may have had water baptism on his mind, but as I began studying in depth this subject of spirit baptism, I need to say it is a vast subject. Last week I titled our, or last, in our last lesson, I titled it Understanding Spirit Baptism. And in that lesson, we were able to grasp some important attributes concerning uh, spirit baptism that every believer should be familiar with. And, and we define spirit baptism in the following way. We, we stated that of spirit baptism that it is that divine operation of God's spirit which places the believer in Christ and his body being the church and which makes him one with all other believers in Christ. And from this work of the spirit, we became familiar with the results that transpire as well. That This is a very important work of the Spirit. In Lesson 16, we prove from the Scripture three main attributes that are true of Spirit baptism. In that first attribute, we saw that every believer is baptized by the Spirit of God. The second attribute we saw 
was that, uh, was that spirit baptism takes place immediately at salvation. That was the second attribute. The third attribute that we saw in our last lesson was that there is one condition in order to be baptized by the Spirit of God. What is it? Faith. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation. That is the condition. Well, since we have laid that foundation already for our understanding and into this important work, we're now going to shift over into those passages that deal with spirit baptism, baptism that we find in past eras. This was fascinating to look at in the scripture. In fact, we're going to discover today that spirit baptism can be found in passages of the Bible that do not deal with the present. I mean, when you go through the scripture and you look through the scripture, you're going to find that there are some verses uh, that are given that were given before the church age began in Acts chapter 2. And so we need to ask ourselves, what about that? What is that about? We're going to wrap our heads around that. In fact, in our lesson today, we're going to find four critical observations concerning spirit baptism within those past era passages. Even though spirit baptism is for every believer immediately at the moment of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, its presence is found within the gospel era as well as during the foundational setting for the church in the book of Acts. Now we believe that all scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. That it's sharper than a double-edged sword. It's worthy of our time and attention today. So we're going to begin our time with those with the, that first critical observation concerning spirit baptism, which is this: it was predicted. It was predicted. That's our first observation that we need to take note of this morning. We learned from our last lesson that one of the results of spirit baptism was that through spirit baptism, the believer is placed into the body of Christ, which would be the church. Uh, or we might say the church universal. That is, every believer, doesn't matter if you're living in America or not, every believer uh, who has placed their faith in Jesus Christ will be a part of the church, or we would say the church universal. Even though this work of the Spirit was predicted in the past, does not mean that those who spoke of this work of the Spirit fully understood its ramifications. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3 that the church was a mystery, However, we do find that there are passages where this work of the Spirit has been predicted before its beginning in in Acts chapter 2. So there are three passages where John the Baptist actually predicted publicly this ministry of the Spirit. And and there's one passage where God revealed this ministry to uh, John the Baptist as well. We find uh, John the Baptist predictions in Matthew chapter 3 verse 11 as well as in Mark chapter 1 verse 8, Luke chapter 3 verse 16, and in John chapter 1 verse 33. Uh, if you would turn with me to Matthew, let, let's go to the New Testament here. We'll go to the first book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, remember the Gospels are saying he's come, he's come, he's here. So we'll go to Matthew chapter 3 uh, verse 11. We know that John the Baptist's ministry was primarily to the Jew. In fact, in verses 4 and 5 of Matthew chapter 3, within that context of verse 11, uh, we read, Then Jerusalem was going out to him, and all Judea and all the district around the Jordan. And they were being baptized by him, by who? John the Baptist, in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. And we know that in the context, there were Pharisees and Sadducees coming out to witness the crowds who were around John. And in verses 7 through 10, John the Baptist uh, caused them out for their unbelief. And so it's a remarkable setting. You have here these um, Pharisees and Sadducees, John the Baptist calling them out. But he then focuses his attention on the Jewish nation, as well as the future ministry of Jesus Christ. This is what he says, verse 11. I'm going to read the first part of verse 11. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. Let me carry that through. Let's just continue reading that. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So this baptism of John the Baptist, it's aimed at a people group. Who's he aimed at? The Jew, right? He's aimed at the Jew. And it it was that they might change their minds. You see repentance there. Repentance. 
about their own sin, that they would begin to anticipate the coming Messiah. But then John says something here that's very unique. He said of Jesus Christ, he will baptize you with who? The Holy Spirit. <laughs> with the Holy Spirit. Uh, we see that uh, right, right here in, in the Gospel of Matthew, with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, this statement is very similar to the one found in Luke chapter 3, verse 16. And in it, we very clearly have two aspects of this future baptism uh, for the future. Um, the first aspect speaks to the, the fact that this ministry of Christ would be future and wouldn't involve John's baptism. Instead, the baptism that John predict, predicted would feature the Holy Spirit. It'd be an invisible spiritual work rather than a physical outward demonstration. And by the way, notice here John the Baptist says nothing about the church. He doesn't say anything about the church there or the body of Christ. John the Baptist is here revealing invisible spiritual church age truth on a very basic level. Now, notice there's a second aspect to this as well, of this prediction in verse 11. And it was that there is this work of fire mentioned in the context. Now, almost immediately, my mind goes back to Acts chapter 2 when I hear fire alongside this spirit baptism. And that's because of Acts chapter 2, verse 3. You're familiar with that text. In that verse, it says, quote, And there appeared to them tongues as of fire. Tongues as a fire. However, the context of Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 tells us that this is a different type of fire than the fire mentioned in Acts chapter 2, verse 3. How do we know that? Context. The context is the key. Matthew 3, John the Baptist has just rebuked those false religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. I want us to continue looking at this, verse 12. In fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So in the context here, you have the wheat mentioned, and it, that wheat refers to believers. Uh, they are the ones who are gathered to the barn. The, the chaff, however, refers to unbelievers who will reject Jesus Christ. They're going to be thrown into the lake of fire. I did a word study on fire and it's found in verse 10 as John speaks to those who will reject Christ, calling them in verse 7 a brood of vipers in verse 7. We also find this word obviously here in verse 12, but then also in Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, just a couple uh, other chapters later, the same Greek word for fire is found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, where it is translated a fiery hell. Now, Arnold Fruchtenbaum comments on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and of fire. And this is, what, um, this is what Arnold says. Everyone undergoes either one baptism or the other. There is no middle ground. The believers will be baptized by the Holy Spirit, but the unbelievers, like the false unbelieving religious leaders who pursued works in the context of Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, will be baptized by Fire. So this is a sobering reality. We just need to note that. Those who reject the gospel by pursuing works over the free gift of God's grace through faith in Christ, who paid for our sins in full, are destined for another baptism, and it is the baptism of unquenchable fire. So this baptism with the Holy Spirit is predicted, and we see it here in Matthew chapter 3. It has been predicted by John the Baptist. He predicted it in Matthew chapter 3, 11. He predicted it in Luke chapter 3, verse 16. But then in Mark chapter 1, verse 8, we also read, I baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Mark chapter 1, verse 8. Well, we know that if the forerunner of Jesus Christ predicted spirit baptism, then it is only fitting that Christ would do the same. Which brings us to our second critical observation. It was taught by Christ. It was taught by Christ. Now, did Jesus teach that in order to be saved, we need to be baptized with water? Ah, some would say so. Turn with me to Mark chapter 16. I have you here in Matthew. Let's go to Mark chapter 16. One book over. We'll go to verses 15 and 16. Mark chapter 16, verses 15. 
15 and 16. What we have here is the Great Commission as recorded by Mark. And in it we read, verse 15 and 16, And he said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. But he who, is, who has disbelieved shall be condemned. And I want to focus here for a moment on verse 16. And I want to re-ask the question, did Jesus have on his mind water baptism in verse 16? Well, as always, the context gives us the answer to the questions that we have according to Scripture. And I find it fascinating that if Jesus meant that one needed to be baptized by water plus faith in order to be saved, that he didn't finish verse 16 with, but he who has disbelieved and has not been baptized shall be condemned. Is that what the text says? Is that what Jesus says? No, it's not. Jesus didn't say, whoever disbelieves and is not baptized shall be condemned. What is he saying there? Whoever has disbelieved shall be condemned. The issue of one's condemnation has to do with their rejection of Jesus Christ, not their rejection of uh, uh, Christ plus some outward ordinance for the church. So then the baptism that Jesus refers to here is in relation to spirit baptism. G. Campbell Morgan correctly stated it this way. He said, oh, I, I'm back a bit there. He said, I'll read it for you and we'll try to get that back up on the PowerPoint. Uh, Mark, if you could throw that back up, thanks. Uh, this is what G. Campbell Morgan said. He that believeth, so that would be the human condition. Um, all right, I'm going to go from here. Let's see if we can pull that up. He that believeth would be the human condition and is baptized shall be saved. So remember from our last lesson, the only condition in order to be spiritually baptized has to do with this issue of faith alone in Christ alone. Mark chapter 16, verse 16, Jesus alluded to spirit baptism. Well, he doesn't only allude to spirit baptism in the Great Commission as recorded by Mark, but we also find him alluding to this work of the Spirit in the upper room discourse. We, we mentioned this already, but in John chapter 14, verse 20, Jesus alludes to spirit baptism when he says, in that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. So this is a spiritual work that would one day commence, given in the gospel era, if you will. It was given before Acts chapter 2, uh, chronologically. And that brings us to our third critical observation concerning spirit baptism. And that third critical observation that we need to make is that Pentecost pronounced the first historical occurrence of the Spirit's baptism. Now, when did Pentecost take place? Is Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, the day of Pentecost. That is Acts chapter 2. Now, in this church age of grace, Paul wrote these words. And I want us to take note of this. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. Tremendous passage. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks. Well, whenever that body, being the church, began, it began with the Spirit of God baptizing believers. So then my question is this. Can we identify when this body, in fact, began, when the church began? Can we do that? I think we can. The church, this body, is not found in the dispensation of law, nor is it found in the gospel era. It is found in the book of Acts when Paul wrote, we were all baptized into one body. He was not writing to Old Testament saints. He was writing to saints who are living in this church age of grace, to believers who are in the city of Corinth. And how do we know? We know because this body that he writes about being the body of Christ, the church universal, from the context of 1 Corinthians 12, began when the Spirit of God baptized believers. Now think about it this way. From 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, we learn that the body of Christ 
and spirit baptism are inseparably linked together. So then, when did the Spirit of God begin this new ministry of spiritual baptism? Well, I'm going to make the case here for a moment that Pentecost pronounced the first historical occurrence of the Spirit's baptism. How am I going to make that case? Well, I'm going to make that case based off of two witnesses real briefly this morning. The first witness is Jesus Christ. That would be Jesus Christ. The second witness will be Peter. We need to remember those words that Christ gave after his resurrection um, and before his ascension. He said in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, if you don't have this verse underlined, underline it in your Bibles. Jesus says, for John, speaking of John the Baptist, baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Notice that future tense, will be baptized with the Holy Spirit when? Not many days from now. So our first witness, Jesus Christ, claimed and predicted that the Holy Spirit would involve himself with spirit baptism within a couple of days from that statement that Christ makes. Not a couple of years, not a couple of weeks, a couple of days. And that duration is important to know. It's important to know because Jesus is saying that this spirit baptism will play itself out in the near future, not in the far future, in the near future from Acts chapter 1, verse 5. And so if you believe that the church or the body began later in the book of Acts, as some would take that position, well, that would then be in the far future. So then, when the gift of the Holy Spirit was given in Acts chapter 2, did the Holy Spirit baptize the Jews into the body? Well, that brings us to our second witness who claimed that the Holy Spirit did, in fact, perform spirit baptism back in Acts chapter 2, and that would be Peter. Peter said in Acts chapter 11, verses 16 and 17, And I remember the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if God gave to them... Uh, and he's speaking there of the Gentiles. We looked at that at our baptism service last week. Peter stood there before the Gentiles, proclaimed the gospel to them. He goes on here, the same gift as he gave to us. When? In Acts 2. Also, after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? To which the Jews then rejoice. They rejoice over that fact that the Gentiles had also been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, between those two witnesses, between Jesus Christ and Peter, we know that spirit baptism had transpired in Acts chapter 2. And since Paul stated that there is an inseparable link between spirit baptism and the body of Christ, this body, or we would say the church, began when? Based upon the words of Christ and Peter. It began in Acts chapter 2, I believe. Again, to suggest that the body began later in Acts would violate biblical truths that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, Acts chapter 1, verse 5, along with Acts chapter 11. Between both Jesus and Peter, we know the timing when this spirit baptism began and later on as the Apostle Paul would communicate church age of grace truth to believers. He would reveal that this work of the Spirit was connected to the, uh, specifically the body of Christ or the church that's made up of Jew and Gentile. Gabelin observed in Acts chapter 2, he correctly observed this, all believers were on that day united by the Spirit into one body. And since then, whenever and wherever a sinner believes in the finished work of Christ, he shares in that baptism and is joined by the same Spirit to that one body. The believing company was then formed on the day of Pentecost into one body. It was the birthday of of the church. In other words, the moment you made the decision to trust in Jesus Christ, you were and I was placed into the family of God. This is a spiritual work performed by the Spirit of God at the moment of salvation. Well, that brings us to our fourth critical point or observation. It is an exclusive event that is limited to this dispensation spanning from Pentecost to the rapture. Now, this last critical observation is no way to, meant to diminish the ministry and the power of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. We've already seen that the Holy Spirit played a significant role in the Old Testament, but we can simply state that his ministry has significantly changed now since the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2. Listen, it doesn't matter who you are, 
what your background is, what sins you've committed. Spirit baptism is a part of this free gift that God has given. It's a part of this grace age gift package that God is offering for free. Perhaps you've not yet received that free gift. I want you to know that God provided a way. We've sinned. God cannot be in the presence of sin. He's holy. He cannot be in the presence of sin. And the wages of sin is death, separation from God, Romans 6.23 tells us. But God made a way. He sent his son Jesus Christ to live a perfect life, to die on the cross for the sin of the world, to rise again from the dead three days later. And if you would make that decision to trust in him, you will be saved, the scripture teaches. Um, there is a salvation passage that some will pull out of context to try to support the unbiblical role of uh, women pastors. And that text is Galatians chapter, two, uh, chapter 3, verse 28. I've seen ministries, I've seen pastors butcher this verse to make it say what they want. The context. What is the context of Galatians 3? Is it the leadership of the local church? No, it's salvation. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. What does it say? There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Well, how did this come about? It came about through spirit baptism. If we go just one verse before, verse 28, we read this. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. This was an experiential there wasn't some extra condition of, of obedience in order to obtain this spirit baptism. This verse is communicating the positional truth of the believer. That is, at salvation, we have been baptized by the Spirit of God. Merrill Unger got it right when he stated this. This ministry, the spirit baptism, is a unique feature of the church age from Pentecost to the rapture. It occurs at no other dispensation. It is always regarded as future until the day of Pentecost and occurs only presently in reference to the church, the body of Christ. It is never found after the rapture of the church nor in the millennium. And so this doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit won't have a ministry in the future after this church age of grace, but it does mean that he will be operating in a different way. And again, we are basing our conclusions here from Scripture. Well, we need to wrap up our time here this morning. I want to do a little bit of a recap to help bring uh, some light to some valuable details that should be noted here concerning the timing of the specific work of the Spirit. The first valuable detail that we need to take here is that spirit baptism is not mentioned in the Old Testament. Jews were not spiritually baptized in the Old Testament and placed into some kind of Jewish church or into some kind of separate spiritual program. You simply will not find a verse like 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 in the Old Testament. The second valuable detail that should be noted is that spirit baptism was not operative until Pentecost. So this is based off of, we've made the case, two witnesses in the book of Acts, being Jesus Christ from the first chapter and Peter in the 11th. After the Holy Spirit had been given to the Jew in Acts chapter 2 and the Gentile in Acts chapter 10. This particular work of the Holy Spirit was not going on during the gospel era. The third valuable detail that should be noted is this, that spirit baptism is only operative during this church age of grace. In our next lesson, we're going to really begin to flesh this out through some passages that will deal with this work of the Spirit within this church of grace, and it'll get very practical, and I'm looking forward to that. And that brings us to our fourth and final valuable detail that should be noted, and that is that spirit baptism will not uh, will not be operative after this church age of grace. When Christ returns at the end of this age, we will go to be with him for a certain time, the church, before his return to earth for the millennial kingdom. And this specific ministry is unique in that we have all been spiritually placed into the body of Christ. But this work will immediately change after the close of this age. Pastor David Thompson made a statement uh, that we would do well, I think, to consider. This is what he said. 
Undoubtedly, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is one of the most significant and vital doctrines in all the Bible, especially for this age. It is a doctrine that affects a believer's life, walk, standing, state, position, and possessions. It is no wonder that Satan has done his best to keep God's people in ignorance and to keep this doctrine in obscurity. This doctrine can literally bring, God, bring power to God's people. For each of us, it is critical that we study this doctrine. We understand the timing of these specific ministries. It is without a doubt that we are living uh, in a unique time. I believe that. Not just as a nation, but as believers. We have this privilege to study positional truth from the scripture that assures us of our salvation in Christ. So today we've learned that spirit baptism can be found in passages of the Bible that do not deal with the present. You'll come across those. Back to what Jesus says. John chapter 14, verse 20. The very essence of Christianity, where Christ says, In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Today we know positionally, uh, positionally secure as those who are secure in Christ by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and made into a new creation where, where Christ lives in us. This tells me that as a New Testament church age of grace saint, if there is a command in the Bible for the believer that I can do that command says um, not because I have any power within myself. I, I can't do what God has called me to in my own strength, but because of the power that works within me. Now, there are those who will take this ministry of the Holy Spirit to say that spirit baptism is an experience that should be, um, uh, that should be sought after, but listen to these words by Miles Stanford. This is what he writes. Quote, We have been bought with the price of Calvary and recreated in Christ Jesus. Therefore, the Spirit is able to carry out God's eternal purpose in us by means of that finished work and flowing life. How vast the number of believers today who are utterly defeated. They do not realize the blessed fact that ever since their new birth, the Spirit has been faithfully ministering within by taking them down into defeat that self might be, um, might be revealed and repudiated. The sooner that we can come to that realization that we cannot live the Christian life, it must be by faith in Jesus Christ, enabled by who? Enabled by the Holy Spirit, heaven will rejoice. I believe that. Um, before we can grasp that truth to a greater degree, we must understand that various eras in the scripture spoke of the spiritual work that took place in our lives after we made that decision to trust Christ as Savior. And as we will see in our next lesson, this practical ministry for the believer in Christ is very, very rich. Heavenly Father, we give you praise and we want to thank you today for the Holy Spirit that you've given him to us. And Father, it may be that we uh, are learning some of the works that he has done in our life at salvation. We didn't even realize it. Father, you have been at work in our life and uh, we give you praise. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit, what he has done. Thank you for the fact that I have been baptized into your body, the church, placed into your family, given a new family. Father, we thank you for your love, your grace. And Father, for any that would be here today or listening online, perhaps wondering where they will spend eternity, I pray that you would help them to see their need for a Savior, that Jesus is that Savior. Father, in that they would make that decision to trust Christ as Savior. Father, we give you praise and we thank you. In your name I pray. Amen. All right.